As a child, I was nearsighted and never saw the stars as more than a blur, smudges in the night sky. I knew stars were supposed to twinkle, but I was never sure quite what that meant. Then one day, I got glasses, and wow, what a difference. Suddenly, the night sky was revealed as crisp pinpricks of light with a variety of sizes and delicate variations of color. More recently, I got a telescope, the sort you can set up in the backyard. It, no, it doesn't look like that at all. But, um, but, the sort, uh, but I like finding Saturn. Um, its rings are one of the most interesting things that you can see with it, and it doesn't really look like that either. But um, it's fun to go out in the backyard with my wife and kids and take turns looking at it. I think stargazing is better with friends and family. Watching the stars and the planets wheel past reminds me of my place in the universe, on a spot on the Earth as it spins in space. Pondering such things can inspire deep thoughts and interesting conversations, such as, what if closure, instead of being a language, had just been a library? Functions, but not parentheses. I think it would uh, be harder to build a strong culture around a Java library. Part of why Clojure has such a vibrant and strong community is because it's different. It's a language with a sense of harmony between expression and functionality. If Clojure was just another library, we wouldn't be here at this conference today. Pursuing Clojure led me to join a startup, provision satellite network systems, fabricate my own widgets, and make systems that would otherwise have been inconceivable to me. Through Clojure, I've met and become friends with many uh, like-minded, intelligent, and generous people. I came for the language, and I've stayed for this community. We have each been given a measure of ability and potential, and I think Rich Hickey has been an excellent steward of his. He didn't just risk his own time and savings to create a language, he seeded this wonderful community built on simplicity and harmony. So I want to take a moment to appreciate all of you, members of this amazing community, and to say thank you, Rich, for giving us closure. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Chowser, and this is a talk about crafting artisanal vector graphics, making aesthetic images, informative diagrams, and effective designs. That sounds pretty serious, Chris. No, you can relax. This talk is lightweight. I just want to encourage people to use SVG because I think, well, I've enjoyed making things with it, and I think it's good, and a high leverage uh, tool if you know Clojure. So let's take a look at some of the things SVG is really good for. To get started, I want to show you some things uh, you can do as far as uh, documentation. And I hope that you'll be inspired by something you see here and go out and make it for yourself or make something else uh, using SVG. So SVG is great for documentation, icons, web apps, and much more. First, for documentation, uh, if you've ever tried to document anything technical, you know the power of the right diagram to help clarify structure and relationship. For example, I love railroad diagrams for documenting grammars. Oh, no, 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 this, this is a UML diagram, um, but I like railroad too. Uh, so, uh, but this is an activity diagram. Um, it's made using plant UML. You can see the, uh, the uh, text of, of or the snippet of text on the left is in this plant UML language. Uh, and that's a language for describing UML diagrams. Uh, the tool, the plant UML tool converted that text into the uh, rendering, the diagram you see on the right. And I think it's a quite uh, short snippet for what a nice complete diagram it makes. Of course, the text on the left isn't really just text. It's also, um, SVG generated from the original text using a different, con yeah, sorry. I like how it makes my head spin, but anyway, the point is SVG is great for UML activity diagrams. Is there another diagram after that or, is okay. Uh, this diagram generated by, is generated by GraphViz. It shows all the Java classes and interfaces related to Clojure. Really complicated, Chris. Um, y yeah, but it, here, zoom in and you can see uh, that it uses shape, color, and position to communicate different details. I, I think it'll make sense. Just stick with me for a minute. I like how you've got a legend here. That's really cool. <laughs> Yeah. You think that'll come up later? Yeah. Okay. Um, so first notice how the legend shows the three different, what the three different shapes mean. A class defined by closure is either an octagon or an oval, depending on whether it's an interface or not. Um, and an interface defined by Java is in that diamond. And then you can see an example of that. If you look for a keyword there in that left-hand column, you can see uh, that's a closure class. And then follow the green arrow to the iPhon, which is a closure interface. And from there, the blue arrows to runnable and callable, which are Java interfaces. The color of the arrows are just there to help you follow them when they cross each other. But the connection and direction indicate class inheritance, going from the parent to the child. So that part of the graph shows that closure keywords can be invoked like a function, which we do all the time when we look them up in maps. You can also see um, a reference up there in the right and follow its arrows backwards to find our familiar closure reference types, agent Adam, var, and ref. 
Finally, the bottom of the legend has a little table of characters for Java interfaces that are very common. If those were diamonds with lines running to them, the diagram would be uh, full of lines and unusable. So instead, you can spot those characters under the names of some of the classes to indicate that they um, inherit those interfaces. Wow, I finally understand refs now, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll use them all the time. Okay, so those are some examples of using SVG for documentation, but it's also great for icons. It's quite common to want icons that look crisp and precise, whether they're large or small. And there's some nice ones. SVG is also great for web apps. You can embed JavaScript, HTML forms, everything a web app needs right in an SVG file. Whee, this is fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, Tim. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> uh, you can even use SVG for making uh, conference slides. If you I get the feeling we're in an SVG right now. <laughs> good. good guess, Tim. You're right. Um, and isn't this fun? Look, Whoa. we can zoom around and... Um, that's so weird. Yeah. You having fun? Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, yeah, and animation. There's nothing here, Chris. No, you can find it. It's a little over. Oh, gosh. There it is. I should have given you the mouse to. Yeah. It's a spider. So scary. Um, I, I, I had that projected on the side of my house a couple years ago for Halloween to entertain the, uh, the trick or treaters. But um, Oh, and you can also use it to make physical things. Are they here? So these are, um, yeah, these are wood, oh, these are wood cuttings um, that were defined in SVG and then cut out using laser cutter. So what is SVG? Well, um, it's a closure talk. We gotta do the definitions. So um, scalable means uh, y you can change the yeah, size. Yeah. I think I think they get it, Chris. Oh. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. Go ahead. All right. So what it's good for is that it uh, it's data, right? Um, which means it's great for a wide variety of tasks. Um, it is data and it's also kind of code. It maintains precision at a wide range of visual scales. It's a widely adopted web standard, so there's lots of tools that can work with it, web browsers and visual editors and lots of diagramming tools. I love that it's extensible and that it supports animation. And I especially like that it lands in a sweet spot on the spectrum of high to low level languages. What I mean is there are many image definition languages and you can imagine plotting them on a scale by how high level they are. At the high end level there on the, on the left, you, can, you have things like plant UML and graph is, which we saw, and mermaid, if you're familiar with that. These formats allow you to convey a lot of meaning with just a few words, and the words are largely about the domain you're trying to talk about, tree nodes or, or, di or participants in a sequence. On the other end of the spectrum are formats like PNG and JPEG. These low level formats are about pixels and color and not about the domain of your diagram or drawing at all. SVG lands in a sweet spot between these extremes where it can be very precise about color and shape and position, but can also contain information about your high-level domain. And finally, it's standardized and builds on familiar formats like HTML and CSS. So the features we've seen so far are uh, supported by all the major web browsers as well as a variety of other tools like Inkscape and Clojure. But why, Chris? Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> okay, so have you ever tried to understand the OAuth 2 uh, flow? This diagram right here can save you hours of reading. That's just the way some things work. I mean, can you imagine trying to do astronomy by a textual description of how to find a star or a planet? Aristotle did it. Well, yes, but Ptolemy improved on that by making a diagram that shows how the stars and the sun and the planets all revolve around the Earth. Hmm, that doesn't seem quite right. Well, he sort of made it work and it was pretty convincing, but unfortunately it required epicycles to be what accurate. in the solar system are those? <laughs> Uh, yeah, a pain to calculate is what those were. So, um, yeah, so there's a diagram that tries to explain epicycles, but Copernicus came along with an even better diagram, putting the sun at the center. Pretty soon, people uh, cottoned on to the idea that the stars aren't spinning around us, the Earth itself spins while orbiting the sun, and the stars in the night sky rotate around the North Star, which is above our Arctic pole because of the spin, not the orbit. And the moon is the odd one out as it orbits the Earth. Did you know that the North Star is called Polaris because it wrote, it's above the poles? I do now. Mm. Actually, it used to be called Sinoshore before the poles were discovered. It has had many names in many cultures that noticed it was special because the other stars appear to rotate around it. Copernicus's work defined the scientific revolution, sparking further investigations in astronomy. He combined mathematics, physics, and cosmology to create a simple, accurate model of the solar system using circles to describe planetary motions. And today, our model remains substantially similar to his original design. Well, the point is, drawing can lead us to truths that are otherwise hard to understand. 
Maybe we should get back to SVG sometime. OK, let's make some SVG. So how do you do it? Well, SVG is a text format. So it's normally stored in a file, uh, and the file usually ends in .svg. Um, but yes, it's XML. Um. <laughs> so uh, Luke already took my XML soap joke, but I'll say it again anyway. Uh, uh, you may, you know, if you see XML, you may be thinking config files that make your eyes glaze over, or soap envelopes, right? But um, and if you don't know what a soap envelope is, good. I don't, I don't, don't want to know. Anything don't worry about, about it. it. Okay, all right. Yes, but. That's not what this is about. SVG is um, lovely diagrams and logos and animation, right? It's art and beauty, not ugly stodginess. So let's not talk about soap anymore. An SVG file starts with this tag. Notice the XML NS attribute. It stands for XML namespace. This tells a web browser or whatever other software is processing the image what kind of XML content this is. And it points out one of the neat things about XML. SVG content can be included inside of other kinds of XML. And other kinds of XML can be included inside SVG. For example, it's common to embed SVG in HTML, and uh, this text right here actually is HTML embedded in SVG. You can also embed RDF and Dublin Core, which provide metadata tags of various kinds. Even though it would be the XML format of, of uh, RDF, it would still be good, right? MathML is a nice for, uh, format for laying out math formula. Uh, Creative Commons has some tags that you can use to declare the license for your content, and all of that can go right in your uh, XML SVG file, each in their own namespace. Tools like web browsers and SVG editors can understand many of those namespaces, and XML defines rules so that if a tool is working on a mixture of content and doesn't understand all of it, it can uh, let you edit and interact with the content it does understand without disturbing or breaking the stuff that it doesn't. So it's a really nice extensibility mechanism. Even better, we can have all that XML goodness in a format that's even more convenient, at least for us closureists, Hiccup. That looks much better, Chris. I really like Hiccup. Yeah, so you can see how it maps directly from the uh, XML there into Closure S expressions. And so here is a uh, complete SVG document in Hiccup. It draws a circle using a circle element, and its R attribute defines its radius. SVG likes short names like R for radius. Anyway, you can do a lot with circles. The vertical position of the circles are set using the CY attribute, which probably stands for center Y. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, several with different CY settings. There you go. That, uh, and what I want you to notice there is as the CY gets larger, that Y dimension gets larger, it gets further down the screen. And that's uh, generally true for SVG coordinates. Larger Ys go down and larger Xs go to the right. Now, if we combine different radius X and Y points with some fill colors, we can add eyes and stuff. That's a really beautiful snowman, Chris. You've done well. Mm, thank you. I'm so glad you could figure out what it was. So. Um, I know it's a lot of numbers, but if you just look at the fill attribute for now, you can see we added a couple black circles and uh, one orange and several gray ones for the mouth. Um, so we're using color names there, but um, later on we'll talk about how to get more precise colors. Okay, so uh, the way the edge of a shape looks can be set using the stroke attributes. The stroke width determines how thick the line is, and the attribute named just stroke defines its color. Hold up, I can't really read the slides there. It's like all over, all oh, over the place. We'll try the next one. Did I? There, I fixed it. I guess so. OK, but I guess I should explain that, that G tag. So OK, so G is for group. And, and that's where you can do um, different kinds of things with groups of elements. So um, it doesn't really do anything by itself, uh, but um, it groups the elements inside of it. So here it's grouping the two circles. Many attributes like fill, stroke, and stroke width uh, become the default values for all the elements inside of it. So even though the stroke information is put on the group, we actually see it on the circles that it um, contains. Gosh, Chris, you could have saved yourself a whole lot of typing if you'd used one of those earlier. Yes, thank you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the transform attribute on a group applies to all of its shapes, all the shapes contained in it as a whole. So in this first example there, the very top line, you can see that the G element isn't doing anything useful, but you can see how the two text elements, the heart and the diamond, stack because they're at the same position. But then uh, we can do these different transforms to uh, that combination as a whole. So you can rotate it uh, where you give it degrees. You can scale it, um, you know, the x and y independently there, or translate it to a new position. And also you can uh, put multiple commands in a single transform tag, uh, separating them with spaces. That's so cool. When should I use a group? If you like it, you should have put a G on it. 
Okay, one last feature, uh, paths. Um, so this is a whole powerful little mini language right inside the path tag. You can make curves um, and straight lines and natural shapes and even aliens. Uh, an animation, oh, and, and animation paths can be, sorry, try again. Paths can also be used for um, animation, uh, for animations to follow and for image masks. Okay, so the value of the D attribute is a list of drawing commands with their coordinates. Um, so that first one, M, is for move to, and it takes the X and Y coordinates. And then L is for line to, and C is for Bezier curve. What? C for Bezier? What? No, no, C for curve. Oh, okay. And Q for quadratic, you know. So this simple path makes a line by first using the M command to move to coordinate zero, zero, um, which by default is the top left corner, and then using L to draw a line to coordinate 10, 10, which is down and to the right. Um, each of those coordinates can be separated by a space or comma, that's right, a comma in an SVG path is white space, just like enclosure. And if you want more segments, you just keep adding more coordinates, just like that. Okay, and then, yes, you um, are showing the, whole, the rolling hills using a curve, so this is using the, uh, one of the curve commands. And the difference between curves and the straight lines is that you have to add these control points. Um, you can see how the control points are floating outside of the straight lines to show how far the curved line should deviate from that straight line. Why aren't your hills green, Chris? Um, well, okay, so let me tell you something about color. Our eyes are imperfect light sensors. We detect three ranges of wavelengths, um, and there is variance in our measurements. And in fact, there's variance in our sensors. Everyone's eyes are slightly different from each other's. And for some, it's even more dramatic where there's colors they can't even see. Our green detectors are usually the strongest, and that's part of why you can't see white text on green, but you can see white text on red just fine. The reality of, cover, of color is quite bizarre. The sun produces many wavelengths, and room lights that seem to be the same color likely produce a different set of wavelengths that look similar when you look at it directly. And of course, displays create R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. But to our eyes, we often don't care as long as we see things. But then when the light reflects, reflects off of an object, only some of the frequencies bounce back. And so something can look very different under the sun versus an LED bulb that otherwise would look like the same color. In some ways, it's kind of amazing we can even talk about color, let alone be specific about which ones to choose. Sure, but what's your point here? Okay, all right. It's really just that using HTML named colors like red, green, and blue um, is pretty limiting. And so you often want to do um, some more custom colors and choose a whole palette. Nobody's got time for that. Good thing you can ask your favorite large language model for some suggestions. They do really well at it. Okay, so you can also put HTML inside SVG. I think I've said that a few times now, uh, and here's how you do it. So a foreign object is used to position and scale the HTML. The first child should set the XML namespace back to HTML so that all the tags inside of that um, will be interpreted correctly. The cool thing about this is you can do text or grids or buttons or inputs, anything you can do in HTML, you can do with this text. SVG does have a text tag, but I prefer embedding HTML for text because it's easier to get it to look how I want. Um, is that not working? You can, uh, because it's HTML text, you should be able to, yeah. Oh. oh, I just don't know how to use your computer, it seems. Yeah, <laughs> so you can select it, right? It's HTML text, so you can select it and copy and paste because um, it's HTML. Nice. And because it's HTML, you can use Markdown to generate it. Next Journal has a nice library to convert a string to hiccup, so we can use that inside of a foreign object. Seems to be a lot going on here. Should I be worried about performance? Well, isn't this good enough? We've got a lot of stuff going on in this one large SVG file, and we're getting like 30 frames a second or something, probably. So I don't think you should worry. Okay, so um, some tools. So here's some tools you can use to make and edit SVGs. So of course, a text editor is a great place to start. You can just make an SVG file and load it into your browser. And a browser is great uh, for showing it because it also has um, debug tools and the ability to there's a crisis. There's a bug what? on this slide. What do you mean, the spider? No, there's an actual bug. Oh, 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 I see. Well, yeah, so if you use the browser debug tools, you can just uh, edit the DOM right there. Nice. Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, also, uh, Inkscape is a nice visual editor for um, modifying uh, SVG files. And you can do um, a lot of SVG stuff at the REPL, and all of your normal tools like Clay and Portal for visualizations um, will come into play then. You can use those. Uh, so here's a, a few tools for dealing with uh, an existing SVG if you want to embed it in your own. Um, first, there's a couple links to uh, websites that have icons 
uh, or I kind of like SVGs uh, and good search engines to, to find them. Um, so we recommend those. You can also just do a general web search, but it's sometimes hard to pick out SVGs from the other things. Anyway, once you've got an SVG and you'd like to embed it in your own, you can use the image href tag and just give it the URL. Or if you're using cursive and Calva, you can open the SVG file and uh, when you copy out from the SVG and paste it into your closure file, it will convert it to hiccup for you. Uh, if you don't have such a fancy tool, you can use this HTML to hiccup website to um, convert SVG to hiccup for you. Okay, so I hope you've seen that SVG is powerful and yet simple enough that it's easy to get started. I hope you've seen some images that are inspiring and now have some details about how to make them. You should try it. Go make some SVGs. Now Tim is going to talk about diagrams and I finally get a chance to heckle you. Yes? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm Tim. And before we get into diagrams, I want to tell you a little story. What? <laughs> Growing up, I had a mischievous uncle who played tricks on me and my brothers. Uh, one day, he asked me what I'd learned in science class, and I told him, energy is conserved. Perpetual motion cannot exist. He smiled, tilted his head, and said, I can build you a perpetual machine out of Lego. I was amazed, and I was certain that he could do it. I pestered him to show me, uh, he kept delaying, and then finally he suggested maybe I should build it myself. I spent hours dreaming up an intricate contraption. It had wheels here, rubber bands there, cogs, so many cogs. How many cogs? So many cogs. <laughs> None of them worked, of course. Eventually I realized that I had not understood what I had learned, and it prompted me to learn more about kinetic energy, potential energy, and friction. Instead of praising me for learning a fact, my uncle taught me something far more valuable. Knowing something is not the same as understanding. Understanding requires critical thinking. Sounds very wise. It's worth thinking about how to think critically. Thinking is a creative process of finding, creating, and improving on ideas. We judge ideas by comparing them. Do they match with reality? Could there be a better explanation? And the result of thinking is knowledge. All the right knowledge can solve any problem. But productive thinking requires crystallization through something like memory, dialogue, writing, and diagrams. In hammocks. <laughs> yeah. Hammocks, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. To illustrate how diagrams help thinking, I want to share with you a psychological analysis. This is a case uh, study of Janet, and she's a student with learning difficulties. Diagrams like this start with some interview notes, and uh, they are just some things about the subject. From those notes, we can identify some key factors, such as Janet live with, lives with her mother. Uh, and then from there, we can identify some causal relationships. Maybe she's passive in math and project work, and that's caused by educational failure, or I should say causes educational failure, and causes her to be far behind the rest of the class. Next, we're gonna identify what the key negative factors are and what the feedback cycles are. This prompts us to look at maybe there is a way for us to break some of these cycles. Similarly, we can look for positive factors and look for ways that we might be able to create a reinforcing positive cycle. So this leads us to some questions like, why is Janet being teased? And can, a small, can her small group learning be increased? Maybe Janet distrusts her teacher. Are you a qualified psychologist? No, but this is a real form of analysis and it's called the Interactive Factors Framework. When analyzing a person, it's often useful to group those factors as being environmental, biological, affective, behavioral, and cognitive. And we do that just to check that we're seeing the whole picture. Here's another type of diagram called a sociogram. And to make this one, the teacher asks uh, everyone in the class, who do you like working with? And each of the students submits maybe three names and then you can plot out all the relationships here. You can see that Mikhail is pretty lonely and William and Emily are popular and they kind of act as a bridge between the boys and the girls. Uh, and over to the right, you can see there's a, a small insular group who only like each other. So it tells you a little bit about the class dynamics and what's happening with, with that. For me, there's something magical about being able to sketch out a problem like this on paper. Uh, it kind of makes the abstract things concrete. You have to create a notation, you have to create definitions and so you see all these relationships emerge and ideas jumping out of the page. And by page you mean screen? Right, yes. yes. Okay. Furthermore, 
it's, it's not always the case that when you visualize a problem, it just solves it. So sociograms and factor analysis are uh, very analytical in nature. They're for trying to discover something. So you want to go ahead and like put everything in and understand it. But on the other hand, many diagrams, like a flow chart, are more about communication. And in those cases, less is more. So what makes a good diagram? Well, a good diagram is clear, informative, and visually appeal appealing. The text should be as concise as possible, but no less. And additional information can be encoded as shapes and styles. Only categorical information uh, should be done this way, not quantitative information. That sort of stuff is better off in the chart. And also, don't overdo it like I did in here <laughs> and use too much encoding. Uh, but this does kind of show you some of the main ways that people encode extra information. Legends are really great for defining these encodings and make sure that if you have a legend, you, you know, define what your relationships are as well because those are important. I think we forgot to put legends on some of our other diagrams. Well, nobody's perfect, Chris. Uh, but please do go ahead and use legends. Uh, doing so, it really does make you think categorically and identify the logical foundations. Uh, I find that if I'm just going to think a bit about the boxes, it often reveals something important about the situation to me. And yeah, you should use color sparingly. Color is a bad distinguisher. Because our eyes have different sensors. Right, right, I remember. And the, yeah, especially in a diagram, the per perceptual distinctness matters a lot. Uh, red means alert, green means positive. Outside of that, I'd really avoid trying to interpret any meaning into colors. Uh, if you need a strong emphasis, you might want to go with a high contrast, such as putting white text on black, but that's about it. Um, it's OK to use color for thematic purposes and just to make it more attractive. But if you do so, uh, consider just using a really faint version of your brand colors or something like that um, so it's not distracting. Uh, you should check your diagrams for legibility, font size, line thickness, and contrast. And most importantly, keep it simple. Don't distract people with irrelevant stuff like we do. Like spiders. <laughs> yes, like spiders. Like spiders. <laughs> I think we need more spiders, personally. <laughs> uh, so on the next slide, we, oh. yeah, I just want to say that you should try and highlight some point that you're trying to make in your diagram. Like chocolate is good. Yes. OK. Um, and always put a title on it. Uh, another thing about diagrams I want to say is that uh, they should be editable. The best diagram isn't a sta static snapshot. They're a dynamic model, and they grow and adapt alongside our ideas and our understanding. The purpose of a diagram is to show things and the relationship between those things, and sometimes we put some grouping in too. Layout plays a huge role in this. Drag and drop interfaces are great if you want to just do some quick adjustments, but it gets a bit tedious when there's a large number of elements. Tools like GraphViz are great for doing uh, automatic layout, but then you lose a, a lot of control. Most tools, tools just do one thing or the other, but Hummy does both. Layout algorithms are surprisingly difficult, and there are some good ones for like trees and force-directed simulations. If you want to look into making your own layout, I highly recommend starting with one of these libraries, Eclipse, Layout Kernel, or my personal favorite, WebCola. You uh, seem quite keen on diagrams, Tim. I am, but what I'm really keen on are graphs. And it just so happens that diagrams are graphs. Graphs are powerful abstractions. They're representations of the real world. And they're capable of revealing deep insights in, and driving optimization. I dare say that the highest leverage concepts in computer science are hashing and graphs. And functions. Oops, I forgot about them, yeah. Uh, they're probably at the top. <laughs> Throughout my career, uh, the main way I've been creating value for companies has been by representing their domain as a graph and applying algorithms to optimizing the task, like routing or resource assignment. And that's been a really big inspiration for me for building Hummy to help people make graphs through diagrams. A good diagram requires an investment of time, effort, and skill, but it's worth the investment. And there's also another layer to great visuals, and that's aesthetics. Aesthetics is the domain of art and images. Images create a sense of theme, of appeal, and interest. Hey, I can see my house from here. 
Uh, so this is the wall in my dining room, and it has a bunch of my wife's favorite paintings that she um, got prints for and, you know, used uh, yard sale frames and made this nice layout in my dining room. So. It looks beautiful. I have also selected my favorite artworks to share with you. Uh, Willie Gillis Goes to College by Norman Rockwell. I can't help but think of pumpkins and the colors of autumn. Rockwell uses warm tones and a thoughtful framing to evoke nostalgia and change. The painting features the historic significance of GI education after World War II. Next we have the bold simplicity, the self-portrait of Pablo Picasso. It's basic shapes, strong lines, and striking contrast. It's imperfect, yet it's unmistakably done with exceptional skill and artistry. Picasso's character shines through both visually and st uh, stylistically. Do you think I could be an art entrepreneur, Chris? Should I start calling out numbers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, second lastly, we have a strikingly <laughs> different self-portrait from Vincent van Gogh. Uh, the eyes are stunning and captivating. One looks directly, piercing at us, while the other kind of drifts lazily away. Maybe a point of distraction, or maybe it's a flaw in the subject. The background feels absent, unobservable, as though we're somehow cut off from it. There's a coolness and a sorrow and a sense of emptiness, mostly from the palette. Lastly, we have the bridge over a pond of water lilies by Claude Monet. It's plain, it's pastel, it's symmetrical, it's soothing. It's limited colors and they communicate shapes and contrast and mood. The composition has been prioritized over visual accuracy. It's beautiful despite being really just a simple pond and a bridge. So what makes these works beautiful? Is beauty just a preference? Uh, I don't think so. Flowers evolved to attract insects and insects evolved to be attracted to flowers, but that leaves a massive gap. It only explains why insects like flowers, not humans, and yet across all cultures, the vast majority of humans find flowers to be beautiful. I wonder if there's any flowers that look like spiders. I haven't seen any. Mm. Spider wart, maybe, I don't know. In any case, a good image brings a fresh perspective to the subject. We don't have a theory of beauty, but there are principles that we can appreciate. Gestalt, Gestalt philosophy contains insights into how our minds perceive visual elements. The Gestalt principles are based on the idea that humans uh, per perceive whole forms rather than parts. Proximity is when elements are close together and they get perceived as a group. This can be used to organize information, uh, make things cohesive, and generally just, uh, you know, form something like a group. Closure, this is where the mind fills in the gaps to create a complete shape. Even when the parts are missing, we can see the whole. This is often present in logos and abstract art as partial outlines that hint at something familiar. Continuity, our eyes follow lines and paths we perceive aligned elements as connected and flowing in a direction, even if they are interrupted by objects. And continuity guides our eyes to a point of interest. Figure ground describes how we distinguish an object from its background. Our brains filter things into a foreground and a background. So is that a hummingbird or a hummingbird-shaped hole <laughs> is what I need to know? I don't know. <laughs> but it looks like a foreground object. <laughs> Symmetrical images are balanced and visually appealing to the eye. We view symmetry as harmonious and organized. Similarly, uh, when we look at similar objects, we group them together. Objects uh, which have a shared shape can sometimes be seen to be the same category even though they are different colors or sizes. Common fate is when elements are moving in the same direction and they are perceived to be part of the same group. Visual cues like arrows or implied movement can be used to draw attention. Gestalt philosophy is a good checklist for crafting visuals, especially so with SVG icons. And I've noticed that a lot of closure projects don't have logos or icons, so I wanna walk you through how you could create one. And my recommendations are to use a light background, adopt a common border, maybe parentheses, and choose a unique inner object that represents your project. I recommend using a limited palette of closure-like colors. And here are some icons. 
from Cyclosh. Uh, the code for creating these is available on the graphic design project, so you can use it to create your own icon. That sounds pretty easy. Maybe I should make a logo every time I write a macro. Definitely. <laughs> Cyclosh collects many interesting libraries. Uh, we have Clay for visualization and publishing, uh, that's the gray ball, and Kindly for annotations, the heart, tablecloth for data sets, metamorph pipelines, machine learning, deep learning, and at the center of it all, Nudge tying them all together, the North Star. Nudge is an opinionated bundle of libraries documented together for science. Nudge is short for Sci Nodger. Oh, like Sinosure, like the North Star. Exactly. I really like Clay for visualization and literate programming. I use it for writing blogs, notebooks, documentations, and presentations. Tomorrow, Thomas will be talking about scientific closure in depth. So the reason I've been sharing my thoughts uh, on aesthetics is that I once had kind of a mental block with visuals. I'd say, I'm a programmer, not an artist, and um, hopefully what I've learned um, I can share with you and encourage you to give it a try. So, but in doing so, there's one more hurdle we kind of need to cross, which is how to draw things. Sometimes we kind of want a human touch. We want an interesting shape that isn't geometric or perfect. Could I just trace it? Yes, you could. <laughs> well, I mean, the real answer is that drawing's a skill, and you should definitely learn it over time. It's worth learning because it enhances your perception, and there's a great book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. But the shortcut is just lean heavily on a reference in image. It could be a photo, an outline, or maybe a collage of other images. And yes, just trace it. <laughs> That's the tip. It's simple, but it works. Uh, if you've got a tool like Inkscape, you can just import the image and draw over the top of it. You might want to go ahead and reduce the opacity of the image just to make it easier to do the tracing. OK, is that it? In conclusion, graphics are valuable, and each of you has the ability to create them. So get creative and make some SVGs. Chris has inspired us with many possibilities and a little how-to guide. I followed up with some design principles for diagrams and opinions on beauty. Oh, next slide. Visualizations provide a new perspective, and that can make all the difference. For centuries, the North Star has been a guiding light. In mythology, it was imagined to be the tip of a spike around which the sky rotates. Today, we understand that it is, in fact, us that spin. What a difference a shift in perspective can make. A shift driven by a diagram of planets orbiting around the sun. I've really enjoyed connecting with so many like-minded individuals here at the Conj and uh, many old friends. Uh, it's really great to be talking with closureists that have a united passion for simplicity, harmony, design, and thinking. This community is something special, and I salute each of you for your part in it. Thank <laughs> you.